now we're going to jump in and take a little bit more of a slant uh, into directly into Hyper-V and talk about some of the virtual machine configurations that we have here. Uh, specifically, we're going to talk about some of the Hyper-V settings and some of the networking that goes on uh, here. One of the things that we have in, in, that we've built in since 2008 R2 SP1, and that's when we introduced it, was dynamic memory. And this was a common request that we wanted to be able to do those uh, types of things like they do with memory ballooning inside of our virtual machine environments, where we can specify, uh, grow and shrink our memory as we need it for those virtual guests. So yes, we do support it. However, one of the things I want to be very clear on, and, and VMware will give you the same advice, you want to make sure you plan this out very, very well. Because what happens if you run out of physical RAM for your virtual machines? If you're actually using your virtual machines and, and there's no more RAM, where do they go? They go to disk to, 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 fill, to fill those need for requests. Well, what happens? That generally will slow down those virtual machines a lot. So one of these things when you're doing this virtual machine memory, there's a lot of technologies that we do under the covers as well as VMware to make sure that we try to avoid that scenario where you're actually hitting RAM. Because at the end of the day, you only have a finite amount of RAM on your servers that you can leverage and use for those different things. So some of the things that we actually do inside of Windows Server uh, is we actually give you minimum and, and maximum startup memory. And I'll show you where all these are in the settings in just a, in just a few minutes. Uh, we do things called smart paging, which I'll talk about in the next time. We can actually do runtime configuration. You can increase the memory without having to restart those systems. So you have the ability to kind of have that, hey, I need to increase this workload, or I can give it a range. And you'll see that here in just a minute. We have smart paging. Smart paging is all about when do I want to use uh, my, my uh, memory versus my, my actual uh, hard drive space. And there's going to be times when you've given a virtual machine a certain amount of RAM, and it's not using the amount of RAM. But there might be requests that need to use or leverage that RAM. It's Hyper-V's way of basically saying, hey, you know what? For this particular access, I can move this down to page file or down to disk while that request is being used. But the minute that VM says, I need that memory back, I'm going to give it back inside of it. And that's very similar to what hypervisor swapping does for VMware. And smart paging is just our way to be able to handle those requests when we get out of that band and out of that concept of memory that we use inside of our environments. Okay, Remove page memory after virtual memory restart. Um, and then eventually that memory is going to come back as reclaimed after our startup. So we have ability to work with those types of things like memory. Moving on quickly into virtual hard drives. Um, this is our uh, VHD, VHDX are our uh, hard drives. These are compares to our VMDK. Just a couple things to be, that you might be interested in. We actually support up to uh, 64 terabytes um, uh, inside those VHDXs uh, versus 2 terabytes for a VHD. So even with our own technology, we really grew how big these uh, virtual hard drive files can be that store our virtual machines and work with them. Um, there's a lot of things we've done with storage under the covers to help uh, protect them underneath the covers, optimize structure for large sector. We've increased the uh, storage protection. We've done a lot of things to really improve how our virtual hard drives work uh, and how they're leveraged inside of the environments. So when you look at these types of things, we can do a lot of things. And that's, that's not even addition, not even talking into, and I don't think it's anything we're going to get into today around snapshots and how we handle snapshots of these files. But we actually do that same kind of level of thing. Oh, Side note, because I got a question early on. Matter of fact, it, uh, uh, one of my counterparts, Julianne, actually emailed me a question before we started. Somebody was on early and asked me a question about DCs and uh, domain controllers. Just real quick before I forget, because I just talked about snapshotting. Um, one of the important things that we put into Windows Server 2012 Active Directory. Now, folks, this is not a Hyper-V or virtualization topic. This is AD real quick. We actually make it uh, virtualization safe now. So you can actually, uh, if you remember in prior versions and even earlier versions of VMware, we said don't virtualize your domain controller. OK, you virtualize your domain controller. Don't take a snapshot. OK, you take a snapshot. Don't ever use the snapshot. And then you use the snapshot, and what happened to your DC? You had GUI rollback, and chances are that DC stopped being a DC. Well, in uh, 2012, uh, Server 2012, we actually introduced a new attribute, um, uh, ba basically a hypervisor GUI ID, a virtualization GUI ID in a sense, uh, to, to control that. And I'll, I'll put a link to an article later uh, in the chat when I get uh, when I um, when Tommy's up next. But basically, at the end of the day, with our VHD files, we now can handle that snapshot rollback because we actually track the attributes inside of Active Directory. It was such an important uh, fix to AD. Uh, we actually exposed the API, and, and VMware adopted it as well as we did adopt it with uh, as Hyper-V as you might imagine. So we're doing a lot of things to help 
understand the capacity of how that storage under the covers is using. Uh, speaking of those VHD uh, files, specifically on the VX, uh, VHDX files, we can actually resize them dynamically online. Uh, I hear a big hooray. This is something we introduced with R2. Um, we can even uh, shrink them if we want to as well uh, online. So we can grow and shrink our VHD files uh, dynamically through our tools inside the virtual machines that we have. So we have the ability to, to leverage additional space, something that uh, VMware had for a while, and we actually just added, um, and I don't think as of yet VMware can shrink, but I'll be surprised if they, they can't do it, but we can now grow our VHDs uh, online inside the environments. Um, storage quality of service. Now this is interesting to me. When, when we talk about this, we talk about IHOPs, and really, you know, I, I like how we understand the metric and how we look at how we can improve this and, 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 and you can trust the performance mod tools that are there. But what's interesting to me is that I don't think anybody really cares so much about the storage quality of service, although it's fairly easy for us to implement. I think you, you care more about latency and how do we handle the speed down to that storage. How can we get to the storage? And Tommy mentioned something earlier when we talk about storage and, and processing those files around using RDMA adapters. Well, one of the things that, that RDMA does, it gives you an immense amount of bandwidth down to that storage. And it's kind of the, the, the future of, I think, most people that are going to be virtualizing workloads are going to look at RDMA down to that actual storage. Depending on what you're trying to do, and, and, and I, Jeff Woolsey has done a couple demos on this, uh, they've run into problems where uh, the RDMA storage got so fast, and it just couldn't go any faster. And they didn't know where the bottleneck was. And they thought it might have been the storage, but it wasn't the actual storage drives themselves. What they found out when they actually did all the investigation, that our latency down to our storage and to our actual things with these RDMA adapters, the bottleneck becomes memory. Now, wait a second. Did, did Matt just say memory? Yeah, I did. Think about that. How long do you want storage to speed the storage to go faster than the memory bus that we have inside of our environments? What happens there? is we have an amount of uh, just an amazing kind of amount of stuff that we can do for that to work with. So understand that when we look at this, latency is important as well. Let me just speed past this slide. And something we put into R2, virtual fiber channel. Um, this is something that uh, being able to use virtual fiber channel from our host is important. But more importantly, how do I actually use virtual fiber channel inside of my virtual machine so my virtual guests can actually get in and use uh, the virtual fiber channel that we have today. Well, one of the things we actually put in it, and, and really it's just a yes, we actually do this. We support import virtualization ID. Uh, we can actually do up to four virtual machines um, uh, channel adapters on that. We have um, multi-path I.O. functionality. So we support a lot of the common functionality. But remember, this is not just talking about our host. This is actually talking about our guests accessing that storage directly. Um, to help maintain their storage, and more importantly, it's supported across live migration. I put this in the category of, yeah, we should have been doing this uh, for some time to go on and, and work with it. Let's switch gears and talk about some of the Hyper-V networking basics for just, uh, for just a bit. Um, there are three main types of networks that we have inside of our Hyper-V um, basic switches and abilities. We have a private, uh, which just allows VM to VM communication. We have internal, which allows VM to VM and to host basically a host loopback in a sense. And then we actually have external, which allows that virtual machine to access the outside world. These are just standard kind of virtual switches that we have that we can use this. Um, you can even assign them VLANs, um, although in the GUI you can only assign it to a single VLAN ID using PowerShell. Uh, and you see an example of a PowerShell script on the slide right now. You can actually assign them multiple VLANs for those VNICs. So we do support it. It's a matter of how you might provision it. So if you've been ignoring PowerShell, uh, uh, we're already in the PowerShell 3.0, and I think 4.0s are on the horizon. And I'm sure 5.0 is being worked on by our good friends Ed Wilson and the scripting guys up at corporate. So uh, learn PowerShell, folks, if you haven't got a chance to do it. It's something that will, that will save you time regardless of whether you're using Hyper-V or VMware. Um, we have a lot of abilities to do some of that basics. Uh, but when I look at that, you know, it's it's not um, what I would call the standard switch. We One of the things that happens underneath the covers is that we have a layer two networking switch. And this is where you're going to see some big differences uh, between how we do things um, compared to VMware. And the actual comparison slide that we'll have in a second will kind of outline that for you. But the Hyper-V extensible switch that we have built into the Hyper-V servers themselves compared to the V standard switch, or just the V switch. It's not the virtual distributed switches that you have in VMware. To do those types of things, that's where VMM, um, or in your case, vCenter, comes into play as well. So we'll talk a little bit about that later. 
But understand we're talking about just kind of a standard switch environment. So don't beat me up too bad and say, well, Matt, that doesn't do all these things. Well, this is just what's built in the Hyper-V itself. We have those abilities to work with those types of things. But what makes us different here is how we, we can do the same kind of stuff. If you look at it, we do uh, uh, bind to a physical NIC or a team. Uh, we can bypass it if we're using SROV. We can do the same kind of things that VMware does, but we approach it in a very different way. We actually give it the ability to kind of make a lot of settings, and I'll show you where some of these are to, to put DHCP guard protection on that. Uh, if you're not familiar with a, a DHCP guard protection, it's designed to help protect against man-in-the-middle types of attacks. If somebody has a rogue DHCP server sitting around, uh, intercept request, this prevents that. We can do network traffic monitoring. Uh, we can use PowerShell and WMI interfaces to do all kinds of things inside the switch. But really how we approach it is best illustrated by uh, kind of how we look at it in this slide here. What happens with our switch, um, and this is where we get to a big difference, we don't actually, whenever somebody has something new, like maybe Cisco comes out with a new piece of hardware um, that, that we want to work with for our actual networking and our physical networking or environment, we, we don't actually replace kind of a Hyper-V switch for that. We actually just extend it. Um, at a very high level, the analogy that I use when I talk about the extent of the switch and the types of things you can do with it is very very similar to what we did with printers back in the day. You remember remember back in the old Windows days, if you had multiple printers from different manufacturers, you had the DLL nightmare, and, and each would bring their own spooler to play. They'd bring their own tools to play. And Windows, kind of when you had all those multiple spoolers for different kind of printers, just would choke. It wouldn't work really well. Eventually, when it became mature enough, we basically said, hey, look, we got your screen here. You just plug in and extend whatever your printer does, but right to the certain API set that we're going to give you, and it allows us to print to that types of things. Well, imagine the same kind of things we do with networking. We actually provide this open and extensible switch that allows customers to bring in whatever kind of switch that they have that allows it to extend those different types of things that that switch may do. It might do forwarding extension. It might do filtering extensions. It allows us basically to plug into our networking model to get that consistent feel. So it gets to the point that to some extent that we really don't necessarily care from a Hyper-V perspective what you're doing on that physical side to make your network sing. We're going to be able to be friendly with it and be able to extend that switch. Um, we support NDIS filter drivers uh, for extensions, and we can also do things with the Windows filtering platform to call out those drivers that people bring in. And we actually support a lot of the common providers here in this thing. And there's several partners. Cisco's Nexus 1000, which is probably, uh, if, if I were to poll the thousands of you that were on this call, I would imagine probably a, a, a hefty percentage uh, is using the Cisco device and probably a Nexus device, especially if you're using uh, that. But you see the other ones. We actually allow that extension uh, very, very nicely inside of our virtual environments. So when you compare it, lots of yeses here. Um, the difference is, is that we don't actually replace it. Ours is open and extensible. So it's kind of geared to not only what the networking gear does today, but what that networking gear is going to do tomorrow. Whereas VMware, they kind of replace those different things. And you get those cute little balloons when you have uh, the Cisco switch in, embedded into that driver. But we actually don't do those types of things. And that's where I think fundamentally you'll see the biggest difference in how you accomplish things with virtualization in Microsoft technologies versus virtualization in VMware technologies. We approach networking very, very different uh, of how we do those types of things. But at the end of the day, if you look at the list, especially when you compare Hyper-V um, to Enterprise Plus, it's a lot of yeses, and, and we accomplish the same types of tasks. We just go about it in a very different method. Uh, and one of the things, and, and, and I'm sure Tommy will probably talk about this later, is that this is one of those learning curves. This is one of those things that you're going to kind of have to learn how we do the networking to understand it. 